been through uh, in this study. Um, you know, at the very beginning of this series, and I've mentioned this many times, but I decided to give this study the title, God's Relentless Grace. And the main reason I did this was because for many Christians, when we think of the book of Jonah, the first thing that comes to mind is the big fish that swallowed Jonah. But I hope that you've seen over the last few weeks that the theme of this book is really about God's grace and about God's continual pursuit of the prophet Jonah and how he never stops pursuing him and in the same way he never stops pursuing us. Um, you know, my parents are here this morning and, and I remember when I was a kid how my parents always stayed on top of me. Lane, did you brush your teeth? Lane, did you do your homework? Lane, do you have everything you need for school? Lane, did you remember that project? Lane, did you thank that person who gave you that gift? And on and on and on. And at the time, when I was a child, it seemed like they were nagging and, and I just wanted my independence, right? But then as I grew up and matured, I began to realize that this nagging was really just their love for me and desire to see me succeed. You know, I think the same is true with God. When you're a new or, or a baby Christian, the thought of God continuing to pursue you, it can honestly seem ki kind of stressful and intimidating and maybe even a little bit bothersome, if we're being honest. But the more that you mature as a believer the more you realize just how thankful you are for God's relentless pursuit in your life. And I hope that this study on the book of Jonah has helped you realize and help you be thankful for that as well. So really quick, before we get into today's message, I want to look back and run down all of the ways that we have seen God's relentless grace on display through this story. So first of all, we saw God's grace in calling Jonah to go to Nineveh. Do you realize that it is an act of grace for God to even include us in his work? We are fallen, we are sinful, we mess up all the time, and God could do his will on his own. He doesn't need us but for him to include us in his work is, is absolutely an act of grace. And then second, in God appointing the storm. You know, at first we might not see this as an act of grace, but more as a punishment. But God was not punishing Jonah when he sent this storm. What he was doing was continuing to pursue him and try to get his attention. And then third, we saw God's act of grace in showing himself to the group of pagan sailors through the mighty storm. And the sailors learned to fear the Lord. Because even in Jonah's disobedience, God, God through his grace used that situation to reveal himself through, to these sailors. And then fourth, God sending the great fish to swallow Jonah was an act of grace. God could have just let Jonah drown and die in that moment, and he could have used somebody else to go to Nineveh. But in sending the great fish, that was an act of grace. And then fifth, God answering Jonah's prayer and having the fish vomit him out and giving him a second chance to go to Nineveh was an act of grace. And six, when, when Jonah got to Nineveh, God using his words... To, to cause the Ninevites to repent was an act of grace. And then number seven, God choosing not to wipe out the nation of Nineveh, but rather to accept their repentance and forgive them was an act of grace. And then eighth, God not granting Jonah's wish to let him die in chapter four, but to continue to question him and seek him. So eight times in this short story, we have already seen God extending grace and God continuing to pursue the prophet Jonah. 
You know, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into the conclusion of the book. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. God, it is alive and active. And this morning, we are trusting that your words, not mine, will penetrate our hearts will teach us more about you and will cause us to leave here a little bit more like you than when we came in this morning, God. And so we are trusting you to do this just that. Soften our hearts, open our minds to what you want to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So last week we saw Jonah's response to Nineveh's repentance, to, to Nineveh's repentance. And to say the least, his response was not awesome. <laughs> uh, we saw how Jonah knew in his head what God wanted him to do, and he knew in his head what God was going to do for Nineveh, that if they would repent, God was going to relent, right? And that's actually the reason that he didn't want to go to Nineveh, because he knew that God was going to forgive them, and Jonah wanted to see them destroyed. And we talked about, however, that it is not God's desire for anyone to be destroyed, but rather for all people to come to re repentance in faith. And Jonah's heart was in such a bad place that he told God, God, if you're not going to destroy that city, then you might as well let me die. However, again, we see God continue to pursue Jonah even when he was in this very dark spot. And in verse 4, God asked Jonah a question. Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry? Let's see how Jonah responds. Verse 5, then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So first we see that Jonah doesn't even answer God's question. You know, I think this is partially because it was really kind of a rhetorical question. It didn't really need an answer. But also Jonah knew that he didn't have a good answer to this question. So he just chose to ignore it. So he left Nineveh, but he didn't go far. Rather, he went up on a hill outside the city and built a shelter to wait to see what was going to happen to Nineveh. You know, it's almost as if God, or Jonah still doesn't believe that Nineveh's repentance was real. And he still thinks that God is going to destroy the city. And so he is sitting and waiting and hoping that he will get to see this city destroyed. You know, have you ever had such a hard heart that you're hoping for something bad to happen to someone else? Wow, that is a bad place to be. And you know, I can speak from experience. I have been there. I have felt that someone did me so wrong that I was just waiting and hoping that something bad would happen to them as well. And what ends up happening when we're in this dark place is it ends up greatly affecting us and our lives. We become miserable, we become bitter, we become angry, and it really ends up impacting us way more than it impacts the person who wronged us in the first place. You know, that is why forgiveness is such an important and a beautiful thing in scripture because it serves to release us from our bitterness and it serves to change our heart. And you know, maybe you're here this morning and right now you're outside the city. You're sitting in your shelter, just waiting, wishing, hoping for something bad to happen to someone who has hurt you. I just want to encourage you this morning, get out of that place. And the way that we get out of that place is we must remember the amazing grace that God has showed us, and we must let that grace flow through us so that we can forgive the person or the people who have hurt us as well. We have to do that, church. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, so the Lord God appointed a plant 
And it grew up over Jonah to become a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Wow, so more grace from God on Jonah, right? This is the third time that we see God miraculously appoint something to get Jonah's attention. First, he appointed the storm. Then he appointed the great fish. And now he appoints a plant to shade Jonah and deliver him from his discomfort. First of all, these appointments, they just show us God's amazing power over creation, right? He just keeps appointing something in creation and it happens. And I think that's awesome. But I also love this because Jonah didn't do anything to deserve the comfort of this plant. He hadn't earned this comfort from God, but this was God's way of extending grace to Jonah and telling him, Jonah, even though your heart is still hard, I still love you and I still care about you and I'm still here with you. And then it says, and Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. You know, this shows that Jonah is still more concerned about his circumstances than about God's will or the condition of his heart. You know, we just saw the city of Nineveh repent, a whole city turn to God, and that made Jonah angry. But this silly shade plant made him extremely happy. You know, that's kind of, kind of foolish, right? Kind of silly. Verse 7, but God appointed a worm, another appointment from God, when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. So here we see God appoint a worm to kill the plant and the comfort, and God appointed a scorching east wind that would have brought great discomfort. You know, when I was studying this passage, I read one person's comments on this. And that person, it wasn't someone I knew, but that person said, would God make up his mind? Is he going to help Jonah or not? But I think this person completely missed the point. Because God was not changing throughout this entire story. He wasn't changing his mind. In fact, God never changes the whole time, God is trying to get Jonah's attention and show Jonah his great love for him. And you know, this is true for us as well. Whether we're experiencing great blessing in life or we're experiencing persecution or discomfort does not define how much God loves us. You know, God is love. In the blessing of life, and God is love in the struggles of life. And either one gives us an opportunity to experience God and to grow closer to Him. If you're a parent, you know this is true. When you bless your kids with good things, or when you punish your kids, one is not an act of love in wanting what's best for your kids, and the other, an act of hatred towards your children. No, they are both acts of love and opportunities for growth. And the same is true of God towards Jonah and God towards us as well. But Jonah does not realize this, and sometimes, honestly, neither do we. God sent the plant, and Jonah was extremely happy. Then God sent the worm to destroy the plant and the east wind, and Jonah again wanted to die. <laughs> you know, it's, what's crazy? We do the same thing. Uh, maybe not quite as extreme as Jonah, but God sends blessing on our lives, and we're happy, and God is good, and praise God, but then we go through a trial in life, and all of a sudden we're thinking, God, where are you? God, what did I do? God, why have you forsaken me? We do that too. The more that we can grow in our understanding that God is good all the time. And God has the best in mind for us all the time. 
the better off we will be and the more like Christ we will become. Let's keep reading. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not even cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? So here in verse 9, God kind of repeats the question that he already asked Jonah back in verse 4. But this time specifically about the plant, and this time Jonah does respond. And he says, yes, I have good reason to be angry. In fact, I am so angry, I want to die. Then we see God make a profound point that I think each one of us can learn so much from. He says to Jonah, look, Jonah, you're caring so much about this plant that you didn't even plant, and you didn't even cause to grow, and it was only here for a day. Don't you think I should have compassion on these people in this great city who I love deeply and on their souls and on their animals as well? Um, as a little side note to this, I want to make the point that when God said more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, that is actually um, talking about children specifically. Um, the, the entire city of Nineveh is believed to be over 600,000 people. So why God chooses to point out specifically the children and the animals, I'm not entirely sure. I, I couldn't find a good reason for that. But the first point that I do see God make here is that we, again like Jonah, sometimes need to learn to care more about the things that really matter for eternity and less about the things that are completely temporary and the things that have no eternal impact. You know, I'm so guilty of this at times. I can get so worried about the things of this world that have no eternal impact. You know, I would classify these things as the comforts of this life. Things like trends and styles and music and sports or weather, or politics, or finances, or educational choices, or pop culture, or how my kids are perceived by those around them. And I could go on and on. And in becoming so focused on these comforts, I can lose sight of what really matters to God, which is people, and souls, and eternity. You know, I love how the Apostle Paul um, what he had to say about this in 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 16 through 18. It's on the screen there. Paul said, Therefore, we, dot, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. We feel that at times, right? Outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles... Sometimes we don't feel that way, but that's really what they are. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Then verse 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, the plant or, or the circumstances of this life, but on what is unseen, the souls of people. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, let me say this point before I move on, though. You know, God has instructed us to be good stewards of all that he has given us. So we should care about politics and finances and education and even pop culture or music. We should care about the stuff, the circumstances of this life, but only if we can view these things with an eternal perspective in mind. You see, it is not that there's anything wrong or sinful about the comforts or, or the stuff of this life, but I honestly believe, I believe this with all my heart, that the enemy the devil, 
He will try to use these trivial things to distract us from what God really has for us, to distract us from his real plan for our lives. You see, the stuff, the circumstances is not the end game. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's the end game. And that is the point I believe Jonah is trying, or God is trying to make to Jonah in this last question. Now, can God use education and sports and politics and finances and music? Can he use the stuff to make disciples? Absolutely he can. But only if we are focused on what really matters and only if we are being intentional. Let me give you a couple examples. I know some of you parents and grandparents here this morning, you spend hours sitting at your kids' sporting events and concerts and shows and performances, and I think you absolutely should. It is so important that your kids see that you support them and encourage them when you can. But have you ever thought about or tried to be intentional about who you sat by in the bleachers or what conversations you had during those times instead of yelling at the refs? <laughs> Ooh, I might have just got a little personal there for, for some of us. <laughs> or I'll give you another example. Maybe that one doesn't describe you. But maybe you spend hours on the lake fishing or, or in a deer stand or working with your hands on a car or a truck or some type of project. Have you ever thought about being intentional about who you spend that time with? or what conversations you have while you're on that boat or working on that truck. You see, I emphasize this point so much because I don't want you to hear, spend time on the things that really matter for eternity and think, well, I guess pastor's saying I need to spend more time at church or I need to spend more time doing door-to-door -door evangelism. I would argue that maybe we can keep doing most of the same things that we are already doing now, but we just need to do them intentionally and do them with eternity in mind. Does that make sense? Now, okay, I have to admit something here. I have had a big problem in the past with how the book of Jonah ends. Because as I shared a couple weeks ago, at the end of chapter 3 seems like a perfect ending to the book. The Ninevites repented. God did not destroy the, destroy the city. Praise God. Let's end the story there. But now chapter 4 seems like a horrible ending to the book. I want there to be a chapter 5. Look real quick at what is the very last symbol at the end of chapter 4. What is it? Very last symbol at the end of chapter 4, or punctuation. A question mark. How can you end a book with a question mark? You know, you can look at the beginning of the next book, at Micah. This is not like a sequel. This isn't a story that continues. So this question never actually gets answered. Why would God choose to end the book with a hanging question? After studying, I actually believe there's a very specific reason that God did this. Because this is a question that he wants every one of us who reads this book to answer for ourselves as well. You see, in this book, every one of us can probably relate to one of two characters. If you grew up in the church and came to Christ as a young age, you probably relate more with Jonah. You know a lot of the Bible. You've served God most of your life, but you have also messed up and strayed from God's will many times. And you're thankful that he has given you grace and given you multiple opportunities. Or maybe some of you relate more to the Ninevites. You did not grow up in the church or, or following God's will. But at some point, God got a hold of you and you repented and you are so thankful that God forgave you of your sinful ways and gave you grace in forgiveness. 
Now, from my experience, and I'm going to make kind of a generalization here. This is not true in every circumstance. But from my experience, those who relate more to the Ninevites experience God's grace in an amazing way later in your life. And you want everyone to experience the same thing you did. Those of you who fall into that category, you relate more to the Ninevites. Your general struggle sometimes is remembering more that your sin has been absolutely, completely forgiven and accepting God's grace. Because the devil will try to remind you of your, your past life. And he will try to get you to believe the lie that God couldn't forgive someone like you and you aren't good enough. However, those who, who grew up in the faith, you know, I, I've heard us referred to, I, I'm that way, I've heard us referred to as Buicks, brought up in church kids. So if you're a, Bu a Buick here this morning, you know, we face a different general struggle. Because we grew up in the faith and around church and it's just been a part of our life basically from the beginning, how do we react when we see that this God the ones who we've spent our whole life serving, even though we, we definitely sin and fall short as time, how do we react when we see that God really does love everyone? Even someone who hasn't spent their life like us serving God. You know, this is where I believe the book of Jonah is written in large part to the Buick, to the brought up in church kid. Because it is a warning that those of us who are blessed to have spent our whole life serving God, not that we're anywhere close to perfect or, or don't fall short all the time, but we can also be the most likely to forget the very nature of the Lord we serve. It can just become callous going through the motions to us. After years and years of serving God and being involved in church, if we're not careful we start to forget how much we really need God daily, just like Jonah. We can find ourselves, just like Jonah, sitting in our safety zone and looking down on the sinful city, those around us who desperately need God, and complaining when we get uncomfortable. This is why the end of the book of Jonah is so frustrating, but also absolutely brilliant. Because it is a question that we have to ask ourselves, and it is a question that we have to create our own ending to. Do we really care about the souls of lost people more and desire to see everyone experience God's grace and forgiveness? Or do we care more about our comfortable Christian lives and the plants in our lives and being comfortable this is a question that we answer daily in the way we choose to live our lives in what we prioritize in life. And this is the question that God is leaving us with at the end of the book of Jonah. Am I going to care more about the plant? Am I going to care more about my comfortable Christian life? Or am I going to care more about the Ninevites around me? about those who are lost, about those who desperately need to hear about the love of God. That's the question that I want us to ask ourselves as we leave this morning. You know, and praise God that although many times I pick my comfort over the Ninevites, God still gives us more opportunities and continues to extend grace to us. And so as we close out this study in this book, I, I don't think there's anything more fitting, anything more perfect that we could do than to sing together about the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. And so we're going to sing that hymn together this morning. It's hymn number 342 in your hymnal, if you want to pull that out. And let's just stand together and sing about this marvelous grace of our loving Lord.